I want to welcome you. Uh, we're going to explore the latest evidence on new and emerging preventive therapies and what the implications are for clinical practice in neurology. The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Exploring the Latest Evidence on New and Emerging Therapies for Migraine Prevention. What are the potential implications on clinical practice? Featuring Dr. Stuart J. Tepper from Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth and Dr. Lawrence C. Newman from NYU Langone Health. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at www. Dot peerview.com forward slash EJR. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. So I'm going to say a little, just a little bit to kick this off, and then Larry will talk about uh, pathophysiology, including episodic and chronic migraine. And really, what we want to do is to take you through how translational research has been made real in migraine, which is a very, very exciting time. As you know, practicing in neurology, we have acute and preventive treatments, but what has changed in the last several years is that we now recognize that some of our medications can do both. They can be used acutely, they can be used preventively. Ergots, which we've actually known about for years, can do both. Uh, NSAIDs can do both the small molecules, CGRP receptor antagonists, not to be confused with the monoclonal antibodies. These small molecules are called GPANTs, and they can be used acutely and preventively and will probably be submitted to the FDA for that purpose. And there are two non-invasive neuromodulation devices that have FDA approval currently for both acute and preventive treatment of migraine external trigeminal stimulation and um, single pulse transcranial magnetic stimulation with another one uh, before that will be before the FDA for acute and preventive treatment. So the, the difference between acute and preventive treatment is, is breaking down. The difference between episodic and chronic migraine is beginning to change as well as Larry will tell you, and, and many patients require both modalities. They require both preventive and acute treatment. The indications for preventive treatment were first promulgated in the AAN guidelines in 2000 and then reiterated in the most recent guidelines of 2012. And we wanted to put this up just to call your attention to the point that if the migraine is disabling the patient, the quality of life is impacted despite the acute treatment or there is a failure of contraindication to or troublesome adverse events with acute treatment, that would be an indication for prevention and where we used to set the bar pretty high for how many days a week required prevention, now we think about what's the impact on the patient. And if they have very frequent migraines, more than one a week, we would consider prevention because times have changed. We also in, uh, intervene with prevention if we think they're going into acute medication overuse or if they are in acute medication overuse to bring them out of it or if the frequency of their headaches is, is beginning to move them from episodic into chronic migraine. Sometimes the patients have a preference for prevention. That may happen more in the future. And sometimes if they have hemiplegic migraine or other kinds of migraine, we would intervene with prevention. These are the AAN AHS guidelines uh, for episodic migraine prevention, and I emphasize episodic. And there are four medications that have FDA approval, topiramate, propranolol, timolol, and divalproex. Everything else not FDA approved. Metoprolol is level A, um, but not FDA approved. Amitriptyline and venlafaxine, a couple of other beta blockers are level B. And candesartan, which was placed as level C six years ago, now has, depending on how you review the studies, either two uh, uh, class one studies or two class two studies. So candesartan would move either to level B or level A. But remember, these are for episodic migraine. 
the only FDA-approved drug prior to the monoclonal antibodies for chronic migraine was onobotulinum toxin A, and the only oral preventive medication with really good randomized controlled data for prevention of chronic migraine is topiramate. And we all know what is going on now in our practices, which is that payers are saying that patients with chronic migraine have to have had a lack of success with antidepressants, antihypertensives, and anti-epilepsy drugs, and there is no evidence base for requiring any, uh, antidepressants or antihypertensives in the treatment of chronic migraine. So there are significant barriers associated with optimal migraine prevention. And the barriers have to do with the oral drugs that we have been using, which um, until recently, none of them was developed specifically for migraine prevention. And a substantial proportion of patients experience a poor efficacy uh, lots of adverse events, poor adherence, they take months to work, and in a study by HEP that was published in 2015, more than 80% of patients that we put on preventive agents for migraine prevention are off those drugs by the end of the year. And the patients just don't stay with them. It's really an exercise in futility. So, of course, the good news is we have three migraine-specific treatments that have been approved in 2018 for migraine prevention, episodic and chronic migraine. And they are, and I'll say these really fast because it's impressive to do that, arenimab AOOE, fremonezumab VFRM, and galcanezumab GNLM. And so these are now FDA approved. And what I'll, I'll be spending the next 20 minutes or so doing is talking a little bit about episodic and chronic migraine and, and, and trying to describe and, and outline the shared pathways that exist between these two conditions. Um, setting up the stage for the new therapeutic targets that have, have been released. And I thought the best place to start on a talk with, with migraine is actually to describe what the criteria are to diagnose migraine. And we'll go over this quickly because I'm, I'm fairly certain this is not new to anybody here. According to the ICHD3, criteria for migraine without aura, the patients need at least five prior attacks. So you can't make the diagnosis until they've had at least five previous attacks. Untreated or poorly treated migraine headache attacks individually should last anywhere from four to 72 hours. And then the diagnostic criteria reads sort of like a, a restaurant menu. You need two from column A, one from column B. So column A refers to the head pain characteristics of which at least two of the following four need to be identified. Unilateral head pain, throbbing or pulsatile quality of head pain, moderate to severe intensity, and aggravation or causing avoidance of routine physical activity. And it's important to realize then that the prototypical description in the textbooks of a one-sided headache being migraine is not necessary. If the headache is bilateral but throbbing and moderate to severe, it still would meet criteria for, for migraine. But that's not enough. Not just the head pain, you need the associated features with migraine. So at least one of two, either nausea or vomiting. And if the patient is neither nauseated nor vomiting, then they have to have both sensitivity to light and sound. So fairly restrictive, but not that difficult to use these criteria. And of course, as predicated by anything in the ICHD3 criteria, before you can diagnose a primary disorder like migraine, secondary disorders must be excluded either by exam, history, or imaging. Now, we talk about episodic migraine, which was just the criteria I showed you, and chronic migraine, and there, there's variability between the two. The largest variability is the frequency. If headaches occur 14 days or fewer days per month, then we give the designation episodic migraine. And quite frankly, that was an arbitrary designation that was made, but it's a designation that stands. When headaches occur 15 or more days per month with the following characteristics that I'll outline, then the patient gets the designation of chronic migraine. It's important to realize of those 15 or more days of headache per month, not all of them need to be migraine. As you can see from, from bullet A, headache can be either of attention type quality and or a migraine-like quality that occurs on 15 or more days per month. The headaches have to fulfill criteria B through D for migraine without aura, the, the previous slide that I just outlined for you for more than five attacks, 
or if it's with migraine with aura, then they only need two previous attacks. But, and here, here's the important but, on eight or more days per month for more than three months, they have to fulfill any of the following criteria. Criteria C or D for migraine without aura, the, the diagnostic criteria of the head pain and the associated features, B or C for migraine with aura, or, and importantly, number three, it has to be believed by the patient to be migraine at the onset. So as the headache is starting, it doesn't have to fulfill all the criteria if the patient believes that that headache would be migraine and it was relieved by a migraine-specific medication such as a triptan or one of the, the few ergot derivatives that we use. And again, can't be accounted by any other criteria, any, any other secondary causes have been, have been excluded. Now, here's what I find to be fascinating. Migraines don't seem to be a static entity. And we know um, that the epidemiologic profiles of people both with episodic migraine and chronic migraine, they, they've been fairly well characterized in the literature, as are the rates of going from episodic migraine to chronic migraine. It's been shown that about 2.5% of patients with episodic migraine each year will transform, if you will, to chronic migraine. And we have some data on the, the chronic migraine remission rate, the spontaneous remission back to episodic migraine. What we don't know quite well, or what we didn't know very well, was the stability of a diagnosis of episodic migraine or chronic migraine over time. So if you were a chronic migraine or would you remain a chronic migraine or without treatment and, and vice versa. But recently a sub-analysis of the CAMEO study, which as you can see stands for the Chronic Migraine Epidemiology and Outcomes Study was done. This, was a, this is a fairly large study, a longitudinal study of adults in the United States with either episodic or chronic migraine identified by, a, by, a self, by, by an administered questionnaire. And what, the, what, the, what the, the authors did was they used this validated questionnaire to classify respondents either with episodic or chronic migraine every three months over a course of 15 months. And, and I'll tell you a little bit about it. It was, it was pretty striking. So if you look at the natural history according to the CAMEO study, there's, there's wide ranges of, of, of fluctuation in the, in the frequency of attacks. Richard Lipton referred to this data, and he's, he was the main driver of this data, as the roller coaster ride of migraine, where there's wide variability in the attacks. And those of us clinicians in the audience see this frequently, and what many of us do is, as the patient's headache frequency decreases, we all take credit for it. Clearly, we've done a good job diagnosing the headache and putting the patient on the correct medication. And when the headaches start to flare up again, many of us think that the patient has gone off, off the wagon. They're, they're, they're not adherent to the medications. They're not, they're not um, decreasing their trigger factors. And that's why the headaches are, are rising again. But in fact, this seems to be the natural history. And from the CAMEO data, we see that the movement between episodic migraine and chronic migraine seems to occur back and forth, but it seems to occur more often in patients who have either high-frequency migraine or chronic migraine. Again, 15 or more days of these headaches per month. Other interesting data from, from the CAMEO study, remember every three months over 15 months, they were given new questionnaires. So, in patients with chronic migraine at baseline, a little over 73% of them had at least one three-month period in which they didn't meet the headache frequency cri criteria for chronic migraine, meaning the headache frequency dipped below 15 days per month. And in about 7.5% of those patients with episodic migraine, they had at least one period when they met headache frequency, where their headache frequency went above 14 per month, and went into 15 or more days per month. So there's wide variability. And this pretty much turns on, on its head what we believe to be happening in, in patients with, with both episodic and chronic migraine. And in fact, it shows that episodic and chronic migraine probably have the same, or definitely have the same biologic mechanisms. Patients seem to move back and forth frequently between both subtypes, both, both temporal profiles, whether it's episodic or chronic migraine. And as Stu will tell you coming up in the next talk, both episodic migraine and chronic migraine respond to these new anti-CGRP medications in the exact same degree, with the same magnitude, whether they're episodic or, or in the chronic form. 
So what it, we also know that the pathophysiologic underpinnings of both temporal profiles of migraine are quite similar. And this has been well documented by Rami Burstein and others. And it would appear that there's two paths to the development of migraine. There's a peripheral pathway, which is a pseudo-unipolar neuron that arises from the trigeminal ganglion up to the meningeal blood vessels and back again. That's a, a, the first order neuron. And there's good evidence for clinical markers of activation of this first pathway in that all pain from within the, the cranium is carried along the first distribution of, of the trigeminal nerve, V1, if you will. And the clinical marker for this peripheral pathway becoming activated is pain, throbbing pain, periorbitally and temporally. Second-order neurons then go from this trigeminal ganglion to the trigeminal nucleus caudalis, from the trigeminal nucleus caudalis in, into the, to the thalamus, with third-order neurons going through the quintothalamic tract up into the, into the cortex itself. So if the marker for the peripheral pathway is throbbing pain and localized cutaneous allodynia, as the migraines go on and, and the, the central pathways here become sensitized, the clinical marker for that is allodynia, not only, not only centrally or, or in the head, but peripherally to other areas of the body. And when the, when the second order neurons and third order neurons become sensitized, patients start to describe this allodynia where hot air, if they open an oven, or hot showers bother their skin and it makes them uncomfortable. The brainstem also seems to be quite intricately involved in the pathogenesis of migraine. And I say this, as you'll see, for a number of reasons. We know that the neurotransmitters at play for migraine, whether it's chronic migraine or episodic migraine, are identical. What's more, what's more striking, however, is that activation in chronic migraine um, and episodic migraine seems to, to be involved with the dorsal raphe nucleus and the periaqueductal gray. But there's good evidence that as migraine frequency increases, the iron deposition load in the peri periaqueductal gray starts to increase. So there's good evidence for, for this site, or these sites, I should say, um, being involved in the pathogenesis. So the brainstem is clearly involved in the pathogenesis of both episodic and chronic migraine. And we've all seen, both in the literature and in, in our clinical practice, or many of us have seen, that pontine lesions from a variety of causes, whether it's a plaque due to multiple sclerosis or, or other lesions within the pons, can cause chronic migraine-like intractable headache, identical to migraine, um, but, but caused by, by a, a, a well-placed lesion. But the question remains, is the upper brain stem the generator of migraine? And it could be because of some of the data we see, but it doesn't explain some of the newer things that we're seeing. And by that, I mean many of the medications that we use to treat chronic migraine. Onobotulinum toxin, toxin A, for example, which works peripherally, or these large um, anti-CGRP molecules, with, which Dr. Tepper will talk about next, which don't cross the blood-brain barrier, still exert their effects both in chronic as well as episodic migraine. CGRP is a 37 amino acid neuropeptide that's widely distributed throughout the central and peripheral nervous system. There's two isoforms with the main isoform expressed in the trigeminal vascular system is the alpha form. CGRP receptors are located throughout all the sites that have been shown to be identified in the, in the pathogenesis of, of migraine. Furthermore, CGRP is linked to major events that occur during migraine. CGRP in the meninges initiates the vasodilatation and the neurogenic inflammation, which are both responsible for inducing the pain of, of migraine. On the cortex, it's important to realize that CGRP enables the NMDA glutamate receptor activation, and that results in cortical spreading depression, which is the underpinning of the aura. It's believed that cortical spreading depression the wave that begins typically occipitally as a excitatory wave and then nearly immediately followed by this neuronal inhibition has been well documented in animal models and, and in, in humans to, to be the, the initiating event in the, in the aura of migraine. And some think that when cortical spreading depression occurs in what's called a clinical silent area of the brain, we can do, it, it then evolves to cause migraine without aura. So there's good evidence, again, that CGRP initiates not only the vasodilatation and the neurogenic 
inflammation causing the pain, but has the ability to, to, to start the aura that's seen in migraine with aura. There's very good evidence that CGRP is involved in the, in the um, pathophysiology, if you will, of migraine. So studies done looking at the ipsilateral external jugular venous blood in, in migraine show that CGRP concentrations rise during spontaneous attacks of, of migraine, and those, those levels remit as the migraine remits. Furthermore, after administration of the triptans, these, the standard drugs that, that we use for acute therapy of migraine, CGRP serum levels decrease. This decrease coincides with the symptomatic relief that the patients say they're experiencing. So in migraine sufferers themselves, if you give them an intravenous infusion of CGRP, it will trigger an attack that is totally indistinguishable from their spontaneous migraines that they typically um, experience. And then, as you'll see, blocking or removing CGRP terminates migraine acutely, depending on the agents that you're using, or can be used in a mechanism to prevent ongoing attacks. So hopefully what you've seen over the last 15, 20 minutes or so is that although episodic migraine and chronic migraine tend, are, are arbitrarily differentiated by the monthly headache days, there's still good evidence that they're fairly similar entities. Many patients, as seen from the CAMEO study, will fluctuate both above and below the diagnostic boundary of 15 headache days per month. And again, the CAMEO data seems to suggest this is more likely to occur in patients with high-frequency migraine, migraines occurring between 10 and 20 days each month. In addition, the, the pathophysiologic mechanisms triggering migraine, both episodic and chronic migraine, seem to be nearly identical. And as we've seen, and as you'll see moving forward, CGRP plays a major role in the major events in migraine attacks, and clearly is a therapeutic target for both episodic and chronic migraine prevention, and coming down the road for acute therapies as well. Um, how are these monoclonal antibodies, the three that were approved, and the one that's in development, how are they different than the preventive medicines that we, have, that we had prior to their approval? Well, as Larry said, the monoclonal antibodies are big molecules, and they do not cross the blood-brain barrier. So they, they work peripherally, and therefore they don't cause CNS side effects. They don't cause depression. They don't cause sedation, and so on. They don't cause dizziness. They are eliminated by the reticuloendothelial system, so they turn out not to cause any hepatotoxicity, unlike small molecules. And I think it's important to note that because they work, it means that peripheral, that peripheral action is sufficient to turn on migraine. You can stop migraine peripherally. Now, will they be an improvement? I'm going to show you data over and over again as to why I think this represents a watershed time for us as practitioners in headache. First of all, all four of them prevent both episodic and chronic migraine. And as I showed you, we have some evidence for topiramate. That's it in terms of medications that we had any evidence for that would work on both episodic and chronic. They also work in medication overuse headache, and they work in migraine with and without aura. Another difference from what we have now is they have very quick onset. They separate from placebo within a week, I'll show you that, and patients show meaningful clinical response within the first month, the majority in the population. And they have unprecedented responder rates of at least 75% reduction in migraine days and higher. They have safety and tolerability so far, similar to placebo because they're targeted, I presume, they clearly decrease acute medication use, and they improve quality of life and reduce disability. Now, sorting them out. Um, let me take you through the list to begin with, and Larry and I are going to come back to this over and over again. We hope by the end you'll have them a little bit sorted in your head. First one approved was Arenimab. And that is the only one which is fully human, and it is the only monoclonal antibody that targets the canonical CGRP receptor. The second one approved was fremenezumab. That's a humanized uh, monoclonal antibody, meaning 5 or 10% is murine, and that targets the CGRP peptide itself, the ligand. The third one approved was galconazumab, so also humanized, 
targeting CGRP itself. And the fourth one is uh, in development, and that is eptinezumab, which is also humanized, also targets the CGRP ligand, and is going, to, is going to be the only one that is infused. It's intravenous. The other three are subcutaneous. The three that are approved are approved for prevention of migraine. All migraine, right? Migraine with and without aura, episodic migraine, chronic migraine, migraine with medication overuse, all migraine. Now, these, these suffixes that are on there are nonsense letters affixed by the FDA to allow distinction for later biosimilar products. Same as the prefixes for the botulinum toxins, onobotulinum toxin A, incobotulinum toxin A, abobotulinum toxin A. Those, those prefixes don't mean anything. But how are we going to remember these suffixes for these monoclonal antibodies. So I'm just going to give you some mnemonics. Arenumab AOOE, always outstanding opportunity, excellent. Fremenezumab VFRM, very fine, really magnificent. And galcanezumab GNLM, great news, lifting migraineurs. And I cannot remember them, so I actually do these mnemonics all the time in my practice. Now, I also keep a matrix, and I think this might be worth doing. The way to think about the studies coming out on these drugs is they should have phase three trials, regulatory trials for prevention of episodic migraine. They should have regulatory trials for prevention of chronic migraine. They should publish their open label extension data on safety and tolerability, and then there will be other randomized control trials and secondary outcome analyses. And right now, what we've got is for arenumab, we have all of the, the regulatory episodic migraine trials are fully published. FP means fully published, so I put a green check mark to tell me that all of the studies are now available in a fully published form. Fremenezumab has one randomized control trial for episodic migraine. It's all the FDA required. It's fully published. Galcanezumab has two for episodic migraine. They are fully published. On the chronic migraine side, Arenumab had one trial, uh, each of them has one trial for prevention of chronic migraine, and two of those have been published. One, we only have the data from abstract. Eptinezumab, we don't have any of the, of the regulatory trials uh, fully published yet. Open label extension data, we have some partial um, fully published stuff, but nothing complete yet. But with Arenumab, we now have data up to four years that have been presented in abstract form. Fremenezumab and galcanezumab have been um, studied in cluster headache. Again, I can give you the, some uh, information, but nothing's been fully published. And other mi uh, migraine randomized control trials, there are some in process, but none have been fully published. Same thing for secondary outcome analyses. And so I try to keep this matrix in my mind so that I know what's been fully published, where I can go and look at all the data. Let's look at what we have. The randomized control trials for episodic migraine, some of them are six-month trials, some of them are three-month trials. And we took out the p-values on these slides. They're all statistically significant against placebo. Those p-values will be online for you. And so if one looks at the six-month trial for arenumab and one of the six-month trials for galcanezumab, and remember all of these are now published, you can see that a drop from baseline occurred for the two doses of arenumab by between 3.2 and 3.7 days. Remember, these are episodic migraine patients. So they had an average of about eight or nine migraine days per month and dropped by um, uh, over three days out of nine. And for galcanezumab, similar drops, uh, actually a little bit higher, 4.6, 4.7 days uh, with galcanezumab dropping from baseline and statistically significant against placebo. And just for completion here are the three-month randomized control trials, just to show you on the right that for eptinezumab it was the same magnitude of drop, um, 3.9 to 4.3 days drop from placebo. On the left are the fremenezumab episodic migraine data, and those data are different in that they didn't 
test different dosages. They tested different regimens. So they tested 225 milligrams once a month compared to 675 milligrams sub-Q every three months. And there was not any difference between those two regimens, but both were statistically significant against placebo. And you can see the magnitude of effect was similar. Moving over to chronic migraine, um, arenumab, the drop was about 6.6 .6 migraine days per month uh, from baseline. And for fremenezumab, the two different protocols, 4.3 and 4.6, uh, didn't matter monthly versus quarterly. And for galcanezumab, a drop of 4.6 to 4.8 mean monthly migraine days. In the chronic migraine trials, the average number of migraine days per month was between 18 and 20 on these patients. But you can see the magnitude of drop was similar. We don't have a graph yet. Uh, what's been presented is a drop for eptinezumab, the one that's in development, which is intravenous, of 7.7 .7 to 8. 0.2 depending on dose, 8.2 days drop from baseline uh, for patients with 18 to 20 migraine days per month. Now we have some major questions. Are, are they going to be safe? How are they going to be different? And are they going to be an improvement? Let's I'll briefly talk about safety. The bottom line on safety, and as I say, we now have data beyond four years for arenumab for over 200 patients. Uh, is that the, the adverse events really don't uh, exceed that of placebo across time with the exception of injection site reactions in the randomized control trial. So injection site reactions for the sub-Q monoclonal antibodies are greater than placebo. Uh, constipation registers for arenumab and respiratory symptoms uh, registers for the other three. Um, and so that's what I tell patients. I say it's going to hurt at the site of injection. Uh, if, you're, if I'm prescribing arenumab, I say you may get some constipation. It's generally transient. It's generally mild to moderate. And for the other two, fremenezumab and galcanezumab, you may get some uh, sniffles, and that tends to go away as well. And otherwise, it's a, it's a very remarkably clean set of adverse events. But... The questions that we went in there with were, number one, would it affect the liver on, a, on an anti-CGRP basis? So far, it has, they have not. And what about these respiratory symptoms? And so far, that's not with every product and not always an, ac an excess of placebo. And then there was a very uh, controversial article by Antoinette Massen Vandenbrink. And we like Massen Vandenbrink's articles because she has the longest last name in neurology and um, asking whether if you take out CGRP and, prevent, and thereby eliminate the CGRP vasodilation, will that result in a loss of compensatory vasodilation in the setting of ischemia, whether that be cardiac or, or uh, cerebrovascular? So I want to show you a study that I guarantee is going to blow your mind. Uh, this was a, I couldn't believe this study, and it's fully published. Uh, this is a double-blind placebo-controlled study in patients with angina uh, because of documented coronary artery disease. And the, and the idea was take patients with angina, give them uh, arenumab, and see if their angina got worse or see if they had an infarction. Uh, and they say stable angina, but for neurologists, this sounds pretty unstable to me. Uh, it was designed to see whether the arenumab would, would worsen stress-induced uh, either ischemia or, or, or result in a myocardial infarction. Here's how the study was done. Patients had to have a history of ischemic heart disease that was proven. They had to have angina occurring at least once a month before being uh, eligible for the study. And there were 88 patients. This is a large study. They put them on a treadmill and they had to last two to 12 minutes on the treadmill. And while they were on the treadmill, they had to get angina or they had to have ST segment change on their EKG. So they had to induce ischemia on the treadmill or they had to have both of those things. And then a month later, they did a second treadmill. <laughs> And again, the patients had to last two to 12 minutes. And again, the patients had to have angina and or ischemia. And then and only then were they allowed into the study. And once they were 
they had met those criteria, then a month later, they were given either intravenous arenumab. Now, we're not talking subcutaneous arenumab. We're talking intravenous arenumab, which would instantaneously take out the CGRP biology. It's an instantaneous CMAX. Or they were given placebo, and they were given a third treadmill. See if taking out the CGRP receptors would, in fact, result in a worsening of the angina or even an MI, and uh, the answer was there was no difference in the change from baseline to the exercise duration as measured by the time of the exercise tolerance test. There was no difference in the time to the onset of the ST segment depression. There was no time to the onset of the angina. There was no difference in the angina. There was no difference in the, and the magnitude of the ST segment change. There, was no, there were no infarctions. There was no evidence for failure of compensatory mechanisms, which if you do the stats means a 97.6% safety margin with this study, which is reassuring. <laughs> Mind-blowing, I can't believe an IRB approved it, but reassuring, it was done at the Mayo Clinic. What about onset of effect? Well, if you look at the intravenous eptinezumab trials, remember that's one in development, uh, they calculated what the likelihood was of having migraine on the first 24 hours of the study for both episodic and chronic, and what they found in both the episodic and chronic studies was there was at least a 50% drop in the likelihood of having a migraine within the first 24 hours of the drug being administered. This is very, very quick onset. In all of these studies, in episodic and chronic migraine, refractory and less so, all of these monoclonal antibodies in the population separate from placebo in less than a week. In the fremenezumab sub-analyses, all the uh, associated symptoms separated from placebo in less than a week. And really the question is whether the meaningful clinical benefit is seen in the first week or the first month, but the majority of patients with these drugs get meaningful clinical benefit within the first month. That's a big change in the way we treat. All of them show this, mean, this reduction in mean monthly migraine days, and you will hear those who diss these drugs and disparage them and saying, but if you subtract placebo, it's only a one or two day difference. Well, that's, it's necessary to look at that from a regulatory standpoint, but our patients don't get placebo, so what we're looking at is the drop from baseline. And that, I'll, I'll, I will show you, I think is quite remarkable. Uh, and looking at responder rates helps, and looking at some of the secondary endpoints helps. So let's look at some of these. In the randomized control trial for arenumab, there was a 6.7 day reduction from baseline. Remember the baseline was 18 migraine days per month. That would mean almost 80 fewer migraine days per year. At the end of a year, they had 10 and a half days from baseline. That's a four month drop in migraine days per year. I don't think anybody thinks that's insignificant works with and without medication overuse, all of them. The 75% responder rates uh, are about a third of patients at 12 weeks, and between 40 and 50% of patients have at least a 75% reduction of mean monthly migraine days at a year. And that's unprecedented. Uh, they work with and without aura. They show a conversion of patients from chronic back to episodic migraine and a conversion of patients from acute medication overuse back to non-medication overuse. And because our payers are requiring the patients have a lack of success with an anti-epilepsy drug and an anti-hypertensive, um, uh, uh, a prospective randomized control trial was done on patients with at least two to five previous preventive failures and uh, 140 milligrams of arenumab worked in those patients. So the drugs plus their sub-analyses showing effectiveness in the patients in whom we anticipate use. So these are positive and encouraging. The safety and tolerability so far comparable with placebo, the responder rates unprecedented high responder rates at 75%. The acute medication use drop 
There's improvement in patient-reported outcomes. They convert from chronic to episodic and from acute medication overuse to no overuse. They work in the patients in whom we're going to try them, patients with previous preventive medication lack of success. They work with comorbid illnesses. I didn't show you that. And I think the Angina study suggests significant safety in cardiovascular treatment. And... Now we're gonna do a little bit of practicum and uh, go over some of the practical aspects of these medications. Dr. Newman, if you would join me. Um, we'll start with how they are changing practice. I mean, we, we talked about what the preventive situation was before the monoclonal antibodies. Our oral medicines were even on a botulinum toxin A, designed for other therapeutic areas, numerous adverse events, take two to four months to be effective, have responder rates of less than 50% for the 50% responder rate, may lose effectiveness in medication overuse, and sometimes don't lower acute medication use. For example, on a botulinum toxin A, lowered triptan use, but not combination analgesic over, uh, overuse. The potential for the monoclonal antibodies is they were designed for primary migraine prevention. I mean, Larry showed you why CGRP was a target, and over the years, you can see this is, this is uh, translational research made real. I mean, this is going from looking at the CGRP to figuring out how to take it out of the picture. And uh, the monoclonal antibodies have wide therapeutic targets, episodic migraine, chronic migraine, with and without aura, medication overuse, and they've been studied in cluster headache, two of them, Feminezumab and galconazumab. Galconazumab is effective in the prevention of episodic cluster headache, although it's not been submitted yet. They have this very quick time to onset, less than a week to a month. They have very high tolerability, so we anticipate that the patients who previously did not tolerate uh, daily oral medications would tolerate these monthly or quarterly medications. There doesn't appear to be a safety signal, and they have unprecedented responder rates at at least 75%, and they lower all acute medication use, not just uh, triptans. So if the current safety is confirmed and cost were not an issue, one could potentially use these preventive biologics first line. The paradigm shift is, is occurring. I mean, the frequency at which we intervene in terms of the migraine is going down, and it really is depending on impact on the patient, preference by the patient, and previous preventive medication trials. And all of that depending on cost and access. So if we, if we take a look at several of these, uh, several of the medications. So Stu outlined the, the data behind it. Here's the, the clinical applications of them. So I'm going to talk first about arenumab and then galconazumab. And as you can see, arenumab comes in a self-injector. The patient is instructed on how to use it, and they then inject themselves every month at home. There's, there's two doses, as Stu outlined before and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Galconazumab, the patients have an option. They can either take a self-injector or they have the option of using a pre-filled syringe. And, and these self-injectors are quite easy for the patients to use. They've been used in other disease states. Um, so the arenumab has been used in the subcutaneous um, sumatriptan injectors. They've, they've been used in, in medications for rheumatoid arthritis. For, for galconazumab, they're used in, and I'm not even going to try and pronounce them, for diabetes and, and for psoriasis as well. This one's yours, too. No, nope, you do, too. Doing this you one? Both, yeah. um, for fremunazumab, fremunazumab comes only in a pre-filled syringe. Um, the patients have an option of one dose monthly, or they can take three doses, we'll talk about this a little bit later, at the same time and give themselves three doses quarterly. Eptanazumab, which is not yet available, it's still in, in, in clinical trials, will be an intravenous infusion, at least at first when it's released on the market, and it will be given every three months. This is mine, yeah. Now we're gonna go back and forth to try to keep you awake. <laughs> so let's talk about arenumab first. This was the first one that was approved. And remember, I said, proof for migraine prevention implies episodic and chronic with and without or with and without acute medication overuse. Two doses, 70 milligrams and 140 milligrams. Currently only available with 70 milligram auto injectors. 
and um, the FDA recommends a starting dose of 70 milligrams. We generally uh, recommend 140 milligrams. There's um, maybe a little more constipation with that dose, but otherwise the adverse events are not greater, and numerically it looks like it may be better than the 70, so we just start with 140 in my office. Um, there are no properly powered studies comparing the two doses. Uh, and we'll say over and over again, the commercial payers are requiring documentation of uh, between two and three classes of migraine preventive medications uh, having not worked for patients before proving the use of all of these monoclonal antibodies. And uh, Renumab is different in that it now has data comparable with placebo for safety and tolerability on over 200 patients beyond four years. So that's the first one. And so if they do the 140 milligram dose, then they have to inject twice at the same time, once a month. You know, they can do one thigh and then the other thigh or on both sides of the belly uh, with these 70 milligram auto injectors. So for Fremunazumab, um, again, all of these have been approved, as you can see, both for ep the, the two uh, temporal profiles, either episodic or chronic migraine, with or without aura in adults. Uh, Fremunazumab is available in two dosing regimens, as I just outlined a couple of slides ago. It, it comes in pre-filled syringes containing 225 milligrams and 1.5 milliliters of, of, of fluid. Um, if given once a month, then it's a 225 milligram subcutaneous shot every month, either in the thigh or in the abdomen. If patients want to do it quarterly, then they take three of those for, for a total of 675 milligrams subcutaneous every three months. Um, Fremunazumab was shown to be effective in patients, and this is important because this is what's going to need to be, is going to be, need to be documented for many of the insurance companies, in patients who have previously failed medi um, preventive medications. Uh, Fremunazumab, as Stu outlined in his previous talk, was also effective in patients with previous use or lack of success with the drugs that we typically use in, in chronic migraine, topiramate and onobotulinum toxin, <coughs> excuse me, onobotulinum toxin A. So this is galcanazumab. This was the third one released. It was approved on <laughs> September 26th, and for reasons that are not clear, it is pronounced galcanazumab. Uh, again, same indications. This one's different, and remember, this one is the one that now has an auto-injector and pre-filled syringe. Patient can make a choice. There's a loading dose of 240 milligrams sub-Q, and then after that, 120 milligrams monthly, a single dose. And I didn't show you on the slides, but when you look at your online, there really was no difference between 120 and 240 across time with galcanazumab. So there wasn't really any reason to provide the higher dose. That's why it, it, it's a 120 milligram maintenance dose for patients after they load. Uh, this uh, was the uh, second ligand antibody approved after fremonezumab and the third of these approved. And uh, this one, um, they presented data at the American Headache Society meeting on galcanazumab. They did a randomized control trial on galcanazumab for chronic cluster headache. It was ineffective. They did a randomized control trial on galcanazumab for episodic cluster headache, and it was effective. So uh, I would anticipate that galcanazumab will be submitted to the FDA for prevention of episodic cluster headache. Fremonezumab is also being studied in cluster headache. Fremonezumab was also ineffective in chronic cluster headache, uh, but, effect, but, but the study on episodic cluster headache is not completed with fremonezumab yet. Okay. <clears throat> and then the potential clinical use of eptinezumab. Um, th this is the intravenous medication that, that we alluded to. Ep there's, it's going to be used for episodic and chronic migraine. Dosing will either be 100 milligrams or 300 milligrams. It will likely, as I had mentioned earlier, be the only anti-CGRP monoclonal antibody that at least initially will be given intravenously and it will be given every quarter. Um, if you look at the data from the studies, the IV dose achieves a nearly instantaneous Cmax. So it works quite quickly. Assuming equal access, patients may be asked in the future whether they prefer to take their injection subcutaneously 
monthly or quarterly, or if they'd like to come into the office to our an infusion suite and, and get their intravenous therapies every, every quarter um, when they start their monoclonal antibody. So in summary, the anti-CGRP monoclonal antibodies, if we talk about safety and tolerability considerations, it, there, there's pretty much only good news, at least to date. In general, the tolerability and the adverse event profiles of these monoclonal antibodies were comparable to placebo across all the clinical trials, except for injection site reactions, and they were mild to moderate. In the trials, as well in clinical practice, about 4% of patients have GI effects with arenumab, and, and the GI effect that they typically have is constipation. And as we talk a little bit later or answer the questions, we can actually perhaps use this to our advantage in, in patients with other comorbidities. There were a slight increase in respiratory symptoms observed with some of the monoclonal antibodies in, in a number of the trials. But to date, and this is important, no, no apparent safety signals have been observed. These medications have not been used in, in, during pregnancy nor in children, obviously, so that studies need to be continued onward, and patients will need to be monitored. We only have a limited subset of data from the clinical trials, but patients will need to be monitored for unusual adverse events as more and more patients are exposed to these medications. So in summary, targeting CGRP as a, as a specific goal in migraine therapy has shown us that we can actually go from the bench to the bedside with, 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 with good results. Pivotal trials have shown that these anti-CGRP monoclonal antibodies are effective in the prevention of both forms of migraine, both chronic and episodic forms of, of migraine. Presently, there's one monoclonal antibody that targets the CGRP receptor only, um, arenumab, and two targeting the CGRP ligand that are approved for prevention of migraine in adults. A third targeting, a third medication that will be targeting the CGRP ligand, which is currently in development and will be given intravenously, has not yet been released. The paradigm changes from these new monoclonal antibodies are, are many, and they include these are basically designer drugs for prevention of migraine. Importantly for us as clinicians, importantly for our patients, they are the first class of preventive medication specifically for migraine since methysurgide over half a century ago. They work quickly, which will, um, which will be quite beneficial. They have low adverse events. They're, they're dosed infrequently, either monthly or quarterly, which will, as you know, for those of us who, who treat patients with migraine um, frequently, uh, there's a, quite a large dropout rate in adherence in, in using daily medications, especially daily medications dosed multiple times per day. The, the dropout rate at the end of six months and a year is, is quite, quite high. Um, unprecedented high responder rates do show us the 50% responder rates, but also the 75% responder rates, which were basically unheard of, and they're wide therapeutic targets. They work for migraine with and without aura, they work for chronic migraine, they work for episodic migraine, and potentially they'll work for the, the episodic form of cluster headache for some of them as well. But as, as we move forward, identifying appropriate candidates, and we can talk about this a little bit later for these new and emerging therapies, is going to be crucial for optimizing the outcomes for, for us and, and, more importantly, for our patients. So, I mean, it's an incredibly exciting time. I mean, I've been working in headaches since the Reagan administration, and this is really the most exciting time of my professional career. The monoclonal antibodies are just one of many very, very exciting developments in headache therapeutics right now. And what's interesting is how, as we learn about epidemiology and we learn about pathophysiology, we, we, I change my view of my, my own patients. One of the aspects I think I've changed is this understanding of episodic and chronic migraine as being dis, dis, different uh, disorders. And in fact, the patients are moving back and forth. And in fact, that's why I'm sure these monoclonal antibodies work equally well in both groups and why it becomes a little less critical to set that 15-day mark that we used to set for onobotulinum toxin A. Here you can come in with a monoclonal antibody once a month for a patient and, and take care of both ends of that as they do the roller coaster. 
Uh, it's been very exhilarating to think about when I first heard about calcitonin gene-related peptide and CGRP, and a lot of our drugs affect CGRP. Um, triptans prevent the release of CGRP and constrict the blood vessels that are dilated by CGRP. Onobotulinum toxin A prevents the release of CGRP. And we've been thinking about CGRP for a long time, but to see this made real and to find out we could actually take it out peripherally is really amazingly exciting and uh, has resulted in not just the development of monoclonal antibodies, but also what you're going to hear about in the future, which are small molecule receptor antagonists called GPANs for both preventive and acute treatment. Right now you have the option of three monoclonal antibodies approved for migraine prevention, a fourth in the later stage of development. The bases of migraine prevention, when we intervene, how we intervene, have shifted and are shifting under our feet, certainly since May. And uh, the available evidence and payer restrictions are making patients who have failed two or more preventive medication classes the first cohort to be treated with these therapies in clinical practice. And interestingly, and in anticipation of that, we have both randomized controlled data and uh, sub-analyses showing that the monoclonal antibodies work in that subgroup. So we can uh, do some questions now. Thank you. All right, question. Please describe representative scenarios in which eptinezumab every three months would be preferable to the three remaining subcutaneous antibodies. So I'll take the first stab at it. Um, and again, where you're asking a hypothetical question because the, the drug yet is not yet on the market, but I would envision patients in whom they don't want to give themselves medication. That's, a, that's an easy one. Many of our patients, even with the subcutaneous injections, I have a small subset of patients who come in every month to, for us to administer their medication, even if they're using the auto-injector. I can envision a, a, a scenario in which, since the drug works, there's a nearly, there's a nearly instantaneous CMAC in patients who come in with status migraine. Uh, someone who's got an ongoing headache that we can't break, um, they're used to coming to an infusion center for treatment, but starting a prevention, having an instantaneous C-max and being able to, to, to break the cycle fairly rapidly. And patients who don't like the injection site reactions of sub-Q. Uh, here's one. I think I'll let you take this one. Are <laughs> you using the CGRP MABs in patients with hemiplegic migraine and other types of migraine or patients who have had stroke-like symptoms uh, given the theoretical concern for decreasing compensatory mechanisms? So I can <laughs> honestly say no, because not yet. I haven't in that scenario. The question is, in patients with hemiplegic migraine, would you use that? And, you know, the reasons we don't use the triptans, I'll, I'll, I'll go backwards. So the reasons we didn't use the triptans in patients with, and, and why they're currently excluded for hemiplegic migraine, or what used to be called basal or migraine, but is now called migraine with brainstem aura, is that back in the day when we were doing those trials, it was believed that those entities were due to vasoconstriction. We now know that it's not due to vasoconstriction, it's due to cortical spreading depression and neuronal, um, neuro neuronal mechanisms. Nonetheless, that has stopped. So the question is, could you use it in, in, could you use a monoclonal antibody in that scenario? And I'd say the jury is still out. I, at least for me, um, I don't have any evidence for it. It's comforting knowing the, the studies on, on angina um, and, and not being worsened, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm hedging here because I really don't have an answer at this point. There are no data, but uh, from a lawyerly standpoint, there is no contraindication to using the monoclonal antibodies in the prescribing information uh, in terms of both hemiplegic migraine and other types of aura. And I have used them in hemiplegic migraine, and I have used them in patients with uh, known vascular disease and older patients. Um, next question, use in adolescents, no data. I'm not using them yet. Um, there is a randomized control trial that I'm aware of uh, that is going forward with at least one of them in adolescents. I am nervous about my, my migraine patients with, um, uh, who, are, uh, who are young women with, of uh, reproductive age 
because I'm aware that not all pregnancies are planned. And these drugs have long half-lives, they stick around for a long time. So I have a very frank conversation with my young patients about contraception before I prescribe, and I have not used them in adolescence. Have you used them? No. So one question is, uh, when you tease out these data, is any one of these superior for any particular endpoint? I'm not convinced. I think they all work about the same. It's possible the intravenous may be uh, superior, um, but there's, you know, there's a disadvantage for patients having to come in quarterly unless they want to, and it's not available yet anyway. We have randomized controlled trial data on eptinizumab showing a 54%, 75% responder rate. So 54% of patients having at least a 75% responder rate at one year and that's the highest that we've seen in any of the studies. But I think they're all pretty much the same. And um, it will basically, I, I, I suspect, come down to what the payer provides and what the pre-authorizations are. And also patient preference for auto-injector versus um, pre-filled syringe and monthly versus quarterly. And, and I'd add to that, you have to remember when these trials were done, they were done against placebo. They weren't, they're not comparator trials. So we're com we are comparing apples to oranges if you're trying to say this one is better than that one. I think the good news I I'm seeing, and I don't know if you've seen it yet, but since we have several months of, of data with, with arenumab, in patients who haven't responded to arenumab, which targets the receptor, switching them to one that targets the ligand, I've seen patients who didn't respond to arenumab but are responding to one of the other two. And I anticipate vice versa. Uh, is there evidence for patients developing tolerance? It's not been uh, published or commented upon. Uh, and uh, we, as I say, we have four-year data, uh, and monoclonal antibodies have been described, and you can go to these randomized control trials. Every single one of them that's fully published will tell you about the frequency of n neutralizing antibodies, of regular antibodies, pre and post. Doesn't appear to amount to a hill of beans. Mm -hmm. I will say one last thing, and then we'll have to close it. Our previous monoclonal antibodies in neurology are immunomodulating monoclonal antibodies. These are not immunomodulating monoclonal antibodies. These are targeting a, you know, a vasodilating peptide. So we would not expect the problems that we have with our other monoclonal antibodies of opportunistic infection and neoplasm uh, with these new therapies. And I thank you very much. I encourage you to go online and grab that. And thank you for coming so early. We're done. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute, Incorporated, and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at www.peerview.com forward slash EJR. This activity is supported by educational funding provided by Alder Biopharmaceuticals, Amgen, and Teva Pharmaceuticals.